Certainly we're grateful to have everyone here today. I think sometimes we take so much for granted regarding the free assemblies that we have. None of us have ever had to be concerned about being persecuted for assembling openly to worship God as the New Testament teaches. That may not seem important, but there are people who have died by the thousands over the years simply to be able to worship God as they saw fit. We need to be thankful of these matters, for they may be commonplace, but they're not really, not down through the history of man. If you ever noticed, and I know you have, if you've given any thought to it at all, about how little is said about the final abode of the wicked after the day of judgment, which is, of course, hell. And that's a terrible thing to think about, so people don't think much about that. But there's something else that you don't hear much about, and that is the day of judgment. The day of judgment. Paul had this to say in his sermon on Mars Hill. And the times of this ignorance God winked at. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he hath appointed a day. In the which he will judge the world in righteousness. By that man whom he hath ordained. Whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. Acts 17, verses 30 and 31. Just as surely as God Almighty has raised Jesus Christ from the dead, then there will be a day of judgment. Thus, in this sermon, I want to discuss the day of judgment. And in doing so, I would like to go over what I'm calling background, and it will be filled with fundamentals that most all of us are knowledgeable of. We know that Christ gave, gave what we call the Great Commission, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Then he ascended into heaven, and that passage, of course, is Mark 16, 15. Our Lord instructed the apostles that they would be His witnesses. They could give eye, as we say, witness testimony to His life on earth and especially to His resurrection from the dead. They would be witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth, Acts 1.8. You'll remember, too, that the gospel was first preached to uncircumcised Gentiles by the apostle Peter, and that was to Cornelius and his household, Acts chapter 10. And to those assembled with Cornelius, the apostle said in Acts 10, 34 and 35, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. As we continue on with background material, as Peter explained to the Jewish brethren in Jerusalem what happened, they rightly concluded, God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Acts eleven eighteen. 18. Now roughly... Uh, Thirty years after the church was established in Jerusalem, the inspired Apostle Paul declared that the gospel had been preached unto every creature which is under heaven, Colossians 1, 23. That is, every person had access to the gospel if they wanted it. When Paul spoke to the philosophers in Athens on Mars Hill, he said, God now... As we read a moment ago, commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Acts 17.30 Things have not changed. Today the gospel is the same. 
men continue to be lost in sin. They need salvation from sin. And time is permitted to go on to give them the opportunity to find God, to learn the truth of salvation, and to obey God's will that they might be saved from their sins. So the church of our Lord continues to proclaim the gospel and to defend the gospel. God continues to command all men everywhere to repent. Let me pause before we go to our next point and emphasize that there is no reason to believe people are going to repent when they have no consciousness of sin. When they have no thought in their mind that they are separated from God and that they are lost. When they do not think of going before the God of all things without beginning or end to give an account of the deeds done in their body. Look around about you, maybe some even in your own family, your neighbors, and they give no thought to ever giving account of everything they've done in this body to their God. They give no thought to an eternal hell for those unprepared to meet their God. But now with the things we've just said, you also find in the New Testament that a certain amount of time would pass. Paul explained, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he raised him from the dead. Now you see that this day is appointed. It's not been revealed when it will come, Matthew 24, 36. But it's been appointed. And a certain amount of time must pass. Now, how long is that going to be? I don't know. And nobody else on earth knows. When Peter wrote about this day, he didn't say when it would occur. But he did reveal something about it. In 2 Peter 3, 3 through 4, he wrote... Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last day scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Again, 2 Peter 3, 3-4. through In other words, enough Time would pass to cause people who don't want to believe in God anyway, who don't want to accept the Bible as the Word of God, who don't think about eternity, who don't think about heaven or hell, and who certainly do not think about the judgment. They just cease to believe. They begin to doubt the promise that the day of the Lord will come. Life will be going on normally. Again, Peter explained that some would be saying, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Now, these are mockers. They're making fun of. They're making light of. Have you noticed just how much of that goes on more today than it did even just a few years ago? Especially on the television. Now, I'm not somebody saying, here are the signs and the end signs, and God must be sending His Son next month. I'm not saying that at all. Because there have been other times, obviously, even in the days when the New Testament was being written, that some would do that kind of thing. When Paul preached this sermon on Mars Hill, when he got to the resurrection, that was bad enough for some. Uh, They pretty well told him to go his own way. uh, Don't call us, we'll call you. Because of their false concepts of, of the body and of the spirit. But you know, those scoffers were right in one thing. 
that everything continues as it has been from the beginning. Well, why is that? Because that's the way God designed the world to operate, Genesis 8, 22. Notice I say design. We have reached a sad state of affairs when somebody can talk about the design of a thing and then deny it had a designer. But that's where we are. And a great many people who are highly educated. In Acts 14, 17, Paul explained to the residents of Lystra God's ongoing providence. He says that stuff... Such serves as a witness for him. The fact that things are orderly, that a design always implies a designer, all those things testify to the existence of God Almighty. Even though many think there are signs that will appear preceding and indicating the final day of judgment, as I alluded to a moment ago, let me make it clear there are no signs pointing to the arrival of that event. Here's what Jesus said about it. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. Here's the conclusion. Our Lord's conclusion. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Matthew 24, 36 through 39. Now, folks, who's saying this? The Son of Man, the Son of God, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Savior of the world. And he knows when he's going to come back. Now he does. When he was on earth, he didn't. But now he does. For he's been glorified with the glory that he had with God before the world was. So I think he knows what he's talking about. The only sign signaling the day of the Lord's coming are the signs that existed during the days of Noah. And what's that? Just what we do every day. There's not going to be anything different going on. They'll be living what we call normal lives. Peter writes in 2 Peter 3, verses 10 through 12, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Now, he wrote this to Christians. Keep that in mind. This is not to frighten the alien sinner to honestly and rationally view his life and see the need to obey the gospel. This is written to people who have done that. The Lord's added them to the church. So he says, Seeing then all, that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation? That means manner of life and godliness. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. Wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. 2 Peter 3, 10 through 12. Our Lord used the same imagery when He discussed this day. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched, and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Matthew 24, 42 through 44. So since none of us and no man knows when this day is going to be, then the only thing to do is be prepared every second of every minute of every hour of every day for the rest of our lives. Now let's look for a moment at the events on that day. The Lord will return from heaven. He's not going to set foot on this earth. There's nothing in the New Testament that says that His second coming He ever will. This is a sin-cursed place. 
but he'll come in the clouds. They will see the Son of Man coming, so Jesus predicted in Matthew 24, 44. Jesus is going to return in just the same way that the apostles watched him go into heaven. Acts 1 and verse 11. I think, though, we'll see that the reaction of the people of the earth at his return won't be quite the same way. And it won't be the same way among everybody that sees him. Faithful children of God are going to rejoice. This old sin-cursed system is gone. It's, it's forever over with. But for those unprepared, which will be according to the New Testament, the great, great majority of people, it won't be. Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18, For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. I don't think you'll sleep through it. Then we which are alive and remain, now notice, shall be caught up together with them the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So I said, he'll never set foot on this earth again. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now what are Christians to do with such words as this? Wherefore, remember, therefore, wherefore, hence, so they're all preceding a conclusion based upon the preceding facts. So wherefore, here's a conclusion, comfort one another with these words. I wish for all of us that we could erase from our minds the handling of things if it's always going to be like it is right now. It just won't be. This is temporary. Think about when you get, on, get in your car and go home. That's temporary. You, it's transportation from this place to some other place to where you're going to be more permanent. That's what life in the flesh on earth is. It's temporary. We're just traveling through. We even sing about that sometimes. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. No wonder the writer of Hebrews says of those unprepared for that day, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. How can we as the church in proclaiming Christ and the gospel to a lost and dying world not give the proper emphasis to what lies ahead for all those unprepared for this day? How can we say we love the church? How can we say we even love ourselves properly when we don't love the world enough to say, this is headed your way and it's inescapable. What are you to do with the remainder of your life? Prepare to meet thy God. For some, the expectation of Jesus' coming is a source of comfort. I'd like to think that that's the case with most of us here, at least in this room, and it ought to be for all of us. In fact, if, if it's not for some of you, you know, you can rectify that before you leave this building. You can become a Christian before you leave this building. For others, the prospect of Christ returning in judgment is terrifying, and so it ought to be. The Lord's return will either be a cause of joy or fear, depending on how one has conducted himself in his life. Our conduct determines our eternal destiny. That's something seemingly many who believe in Christ just don't understand. What you think, what you say, how you act, who you associate with, what's important in your life, what's not important in your life, is going to determine What's going to happen to you when you die or the Lord comes back first? Everyone will stand before Christ in the judgment. Paul explained this in his letter to the church at Corinth. Notice it's the emphaticness of this, how imperative it is. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that everyone may be recompensed for his deeds in the body. According to that which he has done, whether good or bad, 
2 Corinthians 5.10. We will be judged. That means we will be sentenced from the judgment seat according to our deeds. This is the reason God is declaring that all people everywhere should repent, Acts 17.30. To prepare for our appointment before the judgment seat of Christ, we must, as we studied last week, change our lives to make sure our actions are pleasing to Him. As we understand the reality of the judgment, it is essential that we know what the standard of judgment will be. Jesus said that he who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one that judges him. The words that I have spoken, the same will judge him in the last day, John 12, 48. I find myself, and a lot of the posts, and most of the posts I make on Facebook are religious comments or articles, quoting this passage over and over again because of some fantastic ideas that some people put on there that if they knew the Old and New Testaments and its original Hebrew and Greek and had it all memorized, they couldn't find it. People are prone to come up with all sorts of things because they heard it from somewhere, and everybody knows the Scripture that every tub must set up on its own bottom. And you'd be surprised if people wouldn't know that I didn't, wasn't quoting Scripture when I said that. Well, of course that not found in the Bible. Uh, is it? Maybe you better study to find out. Maybe it's there. So to prepare for the judgment, we must change our lives to make our actions pleasing to God. As we understand the reality of the judgment, it's essential that we know this standard that I just mentioned. The Word of God is the standard by which we'll be judged. Therefore, we need to make sure that our deeds are in line with His Word. Do you tell dirty jokes? Do you enjoy listening to them? Do you curse? Do you fail to study the Bible? There's omission now. Do you fail to pray? Do you fail to be concerned about those who need help? Galatians 6.10. This is characteristic of faithful children of God, and you can go on into details. You realize one of the big things is that people just don't care. I'll be glad to get through preaching this morning. You have to give an account to that someday as to why you didn't care. You should have cared. Yeah, you know, once in a while we talk about what foods do you like? Somebody says, Well, I don't like boiled okra. Well, somebody else says, I do. I like tomatoes. Rachel can't stand them. <laughs> well, so that's fine. But we take, when it comes to matters of going to heaven and going to hell, and we deal with it the same way. I don't like hell because I don't like boiled okra. Well, it makes as much sense. We're not realizing that every thought and action we must give an account to Jesus Christ for. And if it's not authorized by His last will and testament, it won't pass. I remember one time when this came to mind this week, but people here that know what I'm about to say or know why it came to mind. We were in a place and Brother Rice was there and two or three others and it was in a Mideastern country. And the people around the airport got their little money that they got because they would carry your bags or push your cart with your bags on it. And they basically just took it away from you and forced you to pay them whatever little bit of a tip you gave them. But this one fellow was following us around and we were trying to get our ride and we weren't sure where our ride was coming from because we didn't know the people that were to meet us. So we were running around. This little fellow was running behind Brother Rice, almost trying to take everything he could from Brother Rice. And he would say, no, 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 no. And he just kept on like a little dog nipping at your heels everywhere he went. Finally, Brother Rice turns around and with that finger he says, I said no, and what is there about no that you don't understand? <laughs> well, going to heaven or hell, God's pretty plain about those obligations on our part. What are they about them 
of what is there about them that we don't understand. Well, I don't understand that. Well, do you have the opportunity to understand? Or you don't have the ability to understand that? If you don't have the ability to understand the plan of salvation, God is going to put you in heaven anyway. But we're talking about people with normal amount of the ability to read and understand. Then you've got to learn from the Bible what you need to do to become a Christian and live a faithful Christian life. The righteous on this day of judgment and the wicked will be separated. Jesus described this when He spoke of the judgment on the final day. But when the Son of Man comes in His glory, we you understood all just what that meant. We talked about glory a while back. What that must mean about the majesty and might and power and honor and and all the angels with him. That'll be a sight. Then he will sit upon the throne of his glory. All the nations are going to be gathered before him. And then he's going to begin to separate them from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Sheep's going to go on the right side, representing the saved. The goats on the left, representing the lost. Matthew 25, 31 through 33. Tells me something about the judgment. It's not when you find out whether you're saved or lost. It's the separation of the saved and the lost. How we live here when we die determines whether we're going to heaven or hell. The day of judgment is a meeting out of rewards according to how you lived here or consequences according to how you lived here. And it's a separation of those who loved Him and kept His commandments all the days of their lives from those who didn't. And sadly, many on the left will be surprised to be there, according to Matthew 25, 44. In the Sermon on the Mount, after explaining that only those who do the will of the Father will enter into heaven, Matthew 7, 21, people seemingly were a bit surprised about that. And when you look at those who claim to be religious today, Seemingly can't get that you must render obedience to God's will or you don't go to heaven. Maybe you'd understand it if we put it down on a monopoly game. You get to go directly to jail. You don't pass go. You don't get $200. You go directly to jail. There's no ifs, ands, or buts, no arguing about it. Depart from me. I never knew you, ye that work iniquity. What are you going to do about that? You will depart. I think there are a lot of people thinking today that because they argue with about everything that anybody ever tells them to do, that they'll be able to argue with their Lord and talk their way into heaven. That shows you how low a state of affairs people's minds are in when they see everything like it is here and how things function here. Many will say to me on that day, notice they acknowledge Him being Lord. Lord, Lord. Did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Matthew 7, and 23. What does that say about all the do-gooders who think because they do so many things that help people physically? And, and, and they do. But they never accept the truth of God's Word. They never acknowledge sin in their lives. They don't understand anything from that perspective. But they think because they did all these things, they mowed the widow's yard down the street, that's fine. But they never listen to the truth of God concerning their own sins and separation from God by those sins and the way to become forgiven of those sins. Those things don't interest them. Well, the Lord's going to say, depart from me, you practice lawlessness or work iniquity. These individuals were ones who believed in God. They thought they were serving Him. Yet they're told to depart. And why is it? We'll read this once again up here and you'll know why. In their minds, they were doing what they thought was the Lord's will. But you know, they didn't study like they ought to, or they could have known better. The Lord hadn't hidden it from us. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, John 8, 31 and 32. But they didn't, and they don't. 
They engaged in practices which had not been authorized by God's Word. But they thought it was all right because they'd been taught all along, well, I feel good about it and I'm sincere in it and if that's the case, God will accept it. Well, you find that in the Bible and we'll believe it. But I can tell you right now, you won't. Those who are judged will go either to eternal punishment, that's punishment unending, or eternal life. Heaven and hell are just as long. No ending. There are important lessons that we need to learn if we haven't already learned some. This judgment day is certain for all men. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad, 2 Corinthians 5.10. So the judgment is for everyone. Somebody said a while back that I'd made the statement. Somebody said, door knocking. Well, we're all headed for the same place. I said, yes, we're all headed for the judgment. I can agree to that. Well, that wasn't original with me. I got it from somebody else. But it's the truth, so it works well, and I used it. And that's right. Everybody in this room is going to the same place, and they die. They're going to the judgment. But there the Lord's going to separate the sheep from the goats. Because the way you live your life, you die lost or you die saved. The Hebrews writer explained the importance of this. Now think about this, brethren. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Hebrews 10, 26-29. Now, that applied actually to Jews who were Christians due to persecution. They are actually thinking about leaving the Christian system deliberately, willfully leaving the Christian system and going back under the law of Moses, as much as they could then. But the principle that comes down to us is this. If I know the truth of Jesus Christ and choose not to obey it, knowing it is God's will for my life, there's nothing going to save us. And if I know I re need to repent of my sins, because I recognize where I've transgressed God's law, and that's what sin is, 1 John 3, 4, but I do not do it, how do we expect to hear from the lips of our Lord on the day of judgment? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. You know, we often hear the law of Moses being very strict when it dealt with the punishing people who broke it. But this says that it's going to be far worse for those who violate the New Testament of Jesus Christ and die in that position. The prospect of receiving the full wrath of God ought to be a terrifying thing, Hebrews 10, 31. This also means that those around us will not escape from this at all. Therefore, we must reach them as much as we can and always be trying with the precious gospel of Christ. In fact, immediately after explaining the certainty of the judgment, Paul wrote, Therefore... Knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. 2 Corinthians 5.11 Have you ever found yourself in a position knowing what's going to happen to folks in a matter of this life, begging them to reconsider, urging them by reason to not go that route or to take the route, whichever way is necessary, and they simply turn a deaf ear to you and maybe even turn upon you and attack you. Well, that's what happens many times when you try to show people how to be able to appear at the judgment so they'll hear from the lips of our Lord, well done, good and faithful servant. They did it to the Lord. Judgment will be according to the Lord's standard. He is the judge, James 4.12, and His word is the standard, John 12.48. Therefore, it is His word that we preach, and Paul told Timothy, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. You think Paul knew what was going to happen to people who died outside of Christ or members of the church who were unfaithful? 
We must speak as the oracles of God, as Peter wrote in 1 Peter 4.11. And this is also why we're not to judge on matters of likes and dislikes and opinions. We judge in the light of God's rightly divided truth, John 7.24. In looking forward to the day of judgment, John wrote, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that every one that doeth righteousness is born of him. 1 John 2, 28 and 29. And John provided some encouragement to those who were following the Lord. He wrote, Herein is our love made perfect. Don't you want your love to be made perfect? That is, complete as God wants it. Well, he says, Herein is how it happens. And he says it happens that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. 1 John 4, 17-18. You know why that's said that way? Because true love always renders obedience to God's will. If you love me. You will keep my commandments. If you're keeping His commandments, where's the fear? That is, fear of what men shall do unto us. And our Lord told us about that. I think the Lord knows how to help us out if we will but submit to His will. And that's the point. Judgment will be final. We'll go to heaven or we go to hell, Matthew 25, 46, all on the basis of how we lived here. Jesus said, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, and the which all that are in the grave shall hear His voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good, under the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil, under the resurrection of damnation, John 5, 28 through 29. What shall we conclude, brethren? First of all, we know that the Lord will return one day to judge the world. But we don't know when that will be. Next of all, Jesus has given us His Word, the infallible standard. And He's given us the time necessary to learn it and obey it. Therefore, be prepared. And the last one. We must use the time we have now to prepare for our appointment before His judgment seat. That is the way that is right and can't be wrong. And I hope that it makes all of us, no matter how faithful we may be, more faithful. Or if there are those who haven't obeyed the gospel, to obey it. Believe that Christ is the Son of God. John 8, 24, Romans 10, 17. Repent of your sins. We've read that, Acts 17, 30. Confess your faith in the Christ as the Son of God, Romans 10 and verse 10. And complete your obedience to the gospel by being baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins, Galatians 3, 26 and 27, and Acts 2, 38. To the members of the church, are you seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness? Matthew 6, 33. Are there any here who are harboring sins and you just haven't turned from them for whatever reason? And now is the time to repent of those sins. Come confessing them. We'll pray with you and for you. And the God of glory has promised to hear and to forgive. But we don't know when that time is going to end. The time of probation is going to come to an end someday. It could come right now. This afternoon. But it's coming. As surely as the Lord was raised from the dead. That time in the mind of God and our future. Whether it's a minute from now. Or a hundred years from now. Whenever. It is set. Just as when Christ came in the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son. Well, we can say the same thing about the second coming of Christ. In the fullness of time, there is a day and an hour out there when God's going to say, go. And the end will come. Everybody that's ever lived will gather before the throne of Christ to give an account of the deeds done in the body. Are you subject to the Lord's invitation? If so, we bid you come while we stand and sing.